Good morning and welcome to Christ First Online. My name is Tiago, I'm one of the pastors here at Christ First Covina and I am grateful that you chose to join us for today's online services. Last week, our family and groups director, Jen, hosted an online service watch party in her backyard while abiding by the recommended social distancing guidelines. We'd like to encourage anyone who would feel comfortable in doing so to invite a few friends over to your place next week so you can enjoy the online service together. Just make sure you're being safe and responsible. I want to invite you to join me on our church online platform if you're watching this live and if you're watching on your TV so that you can enjoy the benefits that the church online platform has to offer. We want you to have the best online church experience possible. Please join me in prayer. God, I'm so grateful for the opportunity that we get to worship you, God, and to hear your word. We're so grateful for everything that you've put in place so that this could happen today. Uh, Lord, we pray that this online service would be a blessing to you as we glorify you through our worship and in our singing, God, and as we glorify you through hearing your word and trying to learn how we can be better so that we can be better used by you, Lord. We thank you so much. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. darkness you are home for the hopeless you are the god who never fails you are full of compassion you are love everlasting you are the god who never fails
I have a few things to share with you, starting with prayer requests and connection cards. Both can be submitted digitally by either clicking the links above the chat window or by going to our website. Last week, I shared with you the type of conversations that are happening at our youth group's Zoom meetings. Don't miss out on all the deep conversations, the, the learning and growing, and of course, all of the fun that goes on on Wednesday nights on Zoom. While our spring community group season has ended, most of our groups are choosing to continue to meet through the summer, some online and some in person. If you'd like to get connected with a group, email us at groups at christ-first.org and we'll help you get plugged in. Every year we take a group of men and women from our church to an incredible men's retreat and women's retreat up at beautiful Hume Lake. And while they may have canceled their summer programs due to COVID-19, they're still very hopeful that the fall retreats will still happen. You can find detailed information on both retreats in the notes and description sections. Hume has guaranteed that any and all payments will be 100% refunded in the event that the retreats are canceled. So feel free to submit your deposit and continue making the necessary payments towards your spot at retreat this fall. Again, detailed info can be found in the notes and description sections. We have a lot of exciting news to share with you, including our plans to reopen our campus in a few weeks. While we do our best to share updates on all church news through social media, the best way to stay informed and up to date is by subscribing to our e-news. Click the link in the notes and description sections to sign up to receive the weekly e-newsletter, which will update you on our plans to gather publicly again, as well as everything else that goes on at our church. We're going to give you about a minute to take care of some of these things right now. Don't forget to submit prayer requests, fill out a connection card, sign up for the e-news, and pull up the sermon notes to follow along with Pastor James in just a bit. Hey, welcome everyone. I want to invite you to turn to the book of Philippians, which is in the New Testament in your Bible. Hey, my name is James and we are in week two of a brand new series. And if you missed week one, you're going to want to check it out on our YouTube channel. It's very important. I set the stage for this entire series. So uh, go, go and watch that as soon as you can. But our series, as a reminder, is called Joy in Constraints. And speaking of joy, here's some joy-filled news. I want to say congratulations to Leanne Soto on the birth of her son Samuel Ezekiel on June 1st. He was born early at 26 weeks. He's two pounds and two ounces. He's stable in the NICU. Let's continue to pray for Samuel. New Zealand, if you haven't heard, has eradicated the coronavirus. That is joy-filled news. Community groups are now meeting in person here at the church. We encourage you, jump in a group and get meeting, get connected. Pastor Marco, he recently celebrated the baby dedication of uh, Sean and Natalie's baby girl, Juliet. And if you haven't heard this, this is amazing. The first koala was born after the catastrophic bushfires in Australia, and his name is Ash. Our youth ministry celebrated two students and one of their leaders graduating, Moriah Tovar, Jeremiah Foote, and Haley Green. And our Monday to Friday preschool has now opened on our campus. It's so wonderful hearing those little children's voices out on the playground. And we are beginning in-person Sunday gatherings on our campus, wait for it, on July 12th. You can read all about the important details in the E! News newsletter. And if you don't receive our weekly E! News uh, newsletter, sign up by clicking the link in the description. And finally, this is a little strange, but a lot heartwarming. 
After two months of being locked down in Spain, a tearful man is reunited with his donkey. Baldo! Hola! ¿Qué pasa? Hola! ¿Dónde está? Oye, ¿qué hace? Hola! ¿Qué pasa? ¿Dónde está mi burrilla? ¿Dónde está? ¿Eh? ¿Qué pasa? ¿Eh? ¿Dónde has estado metida? O más bien, ¿dónde he estado yo? ¿Qué? ¿Qué pasa? Oh, qué tontería. Oye. ¿Qué? ¿Qué? ¡Oh! ¿Qué pasa? Ay, yo también te he echado de menos, eh. Ay, 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 ay. I love an emotional reuniting story. All right, let's jump in. Grab your sermon outline notes, and we're jumping into point number one right away. Number one is human circumstances lie in God's hands, and God uses them to advance the gospel. Philippians 1, verse 12. It says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, there is no circumstance, good or bad, that God can't use to bring the hope found in Christ to those who are far from God. And often in history, we can see that during hard times, hearts are more open to God. So it's really an exciting time when things are tough. It's exciting for the gospel. And the Philippians, they were concerned about Paul's arrest and the prison sentence. And Paul kept his eye on the mission of Christ. And you can hear the joy in his voice as a result in the text. Not that he enjoyed prison, but there is always abiding joy for a believer because there is always an awesome purpose for getting out of bed every morning to share the hope found in Christ. Number two, your joy in constraints inspires others. Philippians 1.14, it says, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, Paul writes, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. See, people are watching you. Your spouse, your kids, your coworkers, your neighbors, your acquaintances, while you process react, and proact, you are sending a message to concentric layers of people who know you or know about you. So what kind of message are you sending them with your life right now? It's easy to be lazy in how you mentally process this. So how can you be the best that you can be even within the constraints you're living in in order to inspire others to greatness? I want to encourage you, don't be lazy in how you think about your actions. Your actions typically come from your conclusions, and your conclusions come from your thinking about what the best next step is. Jesus said the two greatest commandments are to love God and to love people. And you want to inspire people to greatness. You want to inspire people to take their next best step in trusting the Lord. And God uses people to inspire others. God uses you to inspire others. Here's a fact. You are inspiring those around you. All of you are. The question is, what are you inspiring them to? Are you inspiring them to live life better or worse? See, there is no neutral ground here. Paul was in prison. He's human. And I'm sure he may have had a meltdown moment or a pity party or a dance with depression, but he didn't choose to, to stay reactive in his emotions. He rose above them and decided, even in the constraints of being in prison, to keep his joy and faith in Christ in what he said and what he did. 
to the extent that others not only paid attention, but were inspired by it. Let's look at verse 14 again. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul's choices that were no doubt made in the process of cognitive processing, which is hard work, by the way. He inspired Christians around Rome who were not in prison to have greater confidence and boldness in Christ. Henry Cloud, he differentiates between people who inspire others to greatness and those who don't. He uses the term safe versus toxic or unsafe people. Cloud says a safe person does these three things. A, a safe person makes me become a better version of who I was created to be. And an unsafe or toxic person has a pattern of harming you and keeping you from becoming the best version of you. They can do that by actively resisting you or by their inaction of not doing anything to inspire or develop you. So why are they toxic if they don't actively hurt you but just don't do anything to inspire or develop you? Well, likely the reason they don't do anything to help you become a better you are that their thoughts are consumed and saturated with thinking only about themselves. Toxic people like that are often described as narcissistic. People who choose to have no empathy in their thoughts and behavior towards others. Safe people who are close to you are those who help you become the best version of who you were created to be. And Paul inspired Christians to be what they were called to be, which was to preach the word more boldly and without fear. A safe person helps you connect with other safe people. An unsafe person will keep you from connecting. They are controlling, allowing you to connect with others takes away their sense of control. And Cloud says uh, toxic people like that want to turn you into a little cult. They want to own you. They want to possess you. And safe people want to engage in the world with other safe people. Paul says there are some unsafe people who preach the gospel out of envy and rivalry. They didn't want Paul to successfully connect with others because of their jealousy. And then finally, Cloud says, a safe person helps me to get closer to God. And that was Paul's focus. That remained his focus even to the people who put him in prison, which is amazing. Look what Paul doesn't say about the imperial guards. He doesn't call them names. He doesn't degrade them. He doesn't speak bitter words towards them. Paul is being held in jail for discriminatory reasons. It's religious persecution. It's bigotry at its best. Yet, what is Paul's main emphasis with regards to the imperial guards? Let's look at verse 13. It says, It has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for what? Is for Christ. Paul valued his enemies as people created by God and joyfully celebrated the fact that even they came to know that Paul was in prison for Christ. Now, I don't doubt that the imperial guard viewed Paul as a safe person. And that likely led many of them to place their faith in Christ. And you know what? This scene played out in another time, in another prison cell, in the city of Philippi. You can read about it in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 25. But here's some questions for you. Are you a safe person? Do you actively seek to help others be better at who they are? Do you help people close to you connect with other safe people, or do you control them? Do you help people grow in their relationship with God? And number three, final point, is individual value is greater than group identity. The individual value of a person is always greater than their group identity. Philippians 1.18, it says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, Paul says, I rejoice. So I want to encourage you, let's not elevate group identity or tribalism 
over the reality that every individual matters to God and has a right to be loved, forgiven, and given the opportunity to respond to the gospel. See, Paul didn't make a big deal on focusing on group identities. There are three groups in this passage. Number one, there are believers emboldened to share the gospel more. Two, there's the imperial guard. And three, there are selfish believers who elevate rivalry and envy. Though there were three groups with unique identities, Paul's priority above their group identity was one thing, the gospel. What does that teach us today? Well, as Christians, I don't believe we should size people up and write them off just because of what group we perceive they belong to. Doing so is what Satan applauds. For example, Democrats can write off people who identify as Republicans. Republicans write off Democrats. I hear that uh, people who identify with Black Lives Matter can write off those who identify with All Lives, All Lives Matter and vice versa. Yes, every single group identity has values and reasons for why their group exists, and we should humbly converse with those outside our tribe. But what we can learn from Paul, and what I believe we desperately need right now, is to remember the macro identity of every individual person, and that is most important. And so here's the question, what is every individual's macro identity? Well, here's the answer, every person is created by God, for God, and loved and valued by God to the extent that God sacrificed His Son for them. No matter what political identity group you belong to, if you're a Christian, you treat every person, even those who are bigoted and put people in jail for discriminatory reasons, like the Imperial Guard, you treat them like they belong to this group, to the loved by God group. But if your focus is on telling everyone how wrong they are and you deliver that message with a mixture of disdain and, and arrogance, you just might make a good point, but you won't make a difference because they will in turn write you off as an unsafe person. Your point might be right, but you don't elevate a group identity above the macro identity of every individual. I like what Thielman said in his commentary on this uh, book of Philippians. He said, to pay too much attention to the identity of the two groups whom Paul's imprisonment had emboldened to preach, however, is to miss the point of the passage. Paul's concern is not group identity, but with the advancement of the gospel. And what is that gospel message? It's that God loves everyone so much he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for the forgiveness of sins and to change all lives for the better. What an important message in our current culture where people seem to be taking sides or, or, or they get boxed into a certain side in a derogatory way simply because they say a simple slogan, oh, you're in that camp. And then people are sized up and and written off with vicious criticism and cynicism. Imagine all that energy put into degrading someone into a label that you have narrowly and negatively defined, and that energy was put into what Paul did. He valued all people from all groups and all individuals from those groups and courageously advanced the gospel with them. Are you motivated by hatred towards the identity of a particular group? Does your hatred of a particular group ideology eclipse your love for the individuals within that group? That's exactly what Satan wants to happen with your heart and mine. If the other team from yours gets in office this fall, and you emotionally fall to pieces and you get depressed for a long period of time and, and you call yourself a follower of Christ, I wanna encourage you, you might need to repent before God for your idolatry, for raising group identity to such a high platform in your heart. You're elevating that and that's dangerously far from what Christ would approve. See, Christ is above nations and movements. Christ is above the good times and bad times. Christ is all powerful. He is preeminent and above all powers. The only reason the person who is president after the election this fall has breath 
in his lungs or her lungs, who knows what's going to happen, is only because of the power of Christ. And that person, no matter the party they identify with, is valued and loved by God. Don't forget that. And don't stop talking about that. Don't diminish the exalted place of Christ and that exalted place he should play in your life, speech, and on your social media page, and especially in your heart. As much as you're upset about an identity group's ideology, you should be many times more full of joy for the opportunity to advance the gospel to the individuals within those groups, as Paul was. And don't forget to not worry. Christ is still on the throne. Colossians 1, 15 through 20, it says, uh, He, or Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So let's end where we began. God continues to advance the gospel through the weakness and suffering of his people even today. This does not make that suffering good, of course, and we should work to alleviate suffering, but it illustrates that, for example, beautifully appointed buildings, large parking lots, and programs designed to attract demanding church shoppers in a country with the right president doesn't guarantee that God is at work any more than in circumstances of suffering and uncertainty and constraints in doing church online and at home. See, being a Christian can take deep courage in the midst of suffering because suffering can cause us to, to question whether God is working or even whether he cares. No doubt the Apostle Paul would agree, but he would also remind us to not be lazy in our thoughts, to inspire others. He would agree with this quote, this powerful quote. Jennifer Enriquez shared this last week in her teaching to the children, and it's just burned in my mind this week. She shared, when you can't see God's hand, you have to trust his heart. When you can't see God's hand, you have to trust his heart. Thielman says, joy is not the self-satisfied delight that everything is going our way but the settled peace that arises from making the gospel the focus of life and from understanding that God is able to advance the gospel under the most difficult circumstances. And Thielman goes on to say, he says, if in our own circumstances we lack this kind of joy, then perhaps we should search our souls to be sure that our happiness is not more firmly connected to our physical and emotional comfort than to the goals of the gospel. God can and will use you to advance hope, love, and joy, even in the challenges of the constraints you're living in right now. Do you believe that? Are you intentionally inspiring others? Are you a safe person to those around you? Are you caught up elevating group identities over individuals who are valued and loved by God. May God's wisdom and courage be upon you today as you grow in the Lord and join Paul in the priority of advancing the gospel. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for how instructive it is to our situation today. It's just blowing me away that this passage is just so relevant literally to this week. And I pray that you would teach us, that you would rebuke us, that you would refine us, that you would grow us up, that you would um, help us to align our priorities with your priorities, which is to seek and save those who are lost and far 
from you. And God, for those who are far from you, I pray that they would place their faith, place their trust in you, the God who created them, who loves them and has a purpose for them. And they can do that by admitting their sins, by believing that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and choosing by faith to follow Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I pray, Lord, that you do an amazing work as you have done in every individual's life and history who turns to you. We just give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name, amen.
We're going to go into a time of offering right now, and uh, the church's job, uh, as a reminder, is to live so that people can see that God is real. And when people see that God is real, they're more likely to acknowledge the reality of a personal and loving God in their everyday lives. They are more likely to place their trust and faith in God's rescue plan for humanity through Jesus Christ. And here at Christ First, we express that through our mission statement, which is we exist to equip every generation to reach their relational world for Christ. And when you generously and sacrificially give, you partner with everyone else generously giving to help people, people you know, and even more people you don't know. You're helping and inspiring people to see that God is real. And that investment comes with an eternal return on your investment. And that's a greater return than any company's stock on the stock market. See, the gospel will outlive even the largest stocks on the market like Apple or Alphabet, which is Google and Microsoft. There are three ways that you can invest eternally. You can mail in your gift, you can give online, and you can use text to give. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to give. We give because you gave first. And you gave to change our lives. You gave to forgive us. You gave to bring us hope. You gave so that we might spend eternity with you and have assurance of heaven one day. And so, Lord, may we give for those reasons as well, to honor you above all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. Mrs. Jennifer will be teaching part five of Joseph's story in just a bit, so make sure your kids are ready to watch. We can't wait to see you on July 12th. Until then, keep tuning into our online services. If you enjoyed today's service, head over to YouTube and click the thumbs up icon below the video to give it a like. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week in Christ. I'm so hungry. I'm starving. What's for dinner? Is it lunchtime yet? Food. We all need food every day. And most of us eat three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So many of us are so blessed, we have the ability to ask or decide what we're going to eat by having choices. Maybe dad will ask you, do you want a hamburger or a hot dog? Or mom says, do you want pasta or tacos tonight? By the way, the answer is always tacos. <laughs> we are all so used to having choices when it comes to what we will eat. So imagine not really having very many choices or even more difficult, imagine not having enough food to eat, period. Think about going into your cupboards at home and opening them up and seeing nothing. Well, our story this week with Joseph picks back up in chapter 42 of Genesis with his family, and specifically his dad, Jacob. Listen to this right out of scripture. When Jacob heard that grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are you standing around looking at one another? I have heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we'll die. Notice what's being said. And remember what we learned last week too. Why does it matter that Jacob heard about grain being available in Egypt? Do you remember the famine that had happened in Egypt? Well, it had spread throughout the region or the area of the world. It didn't happen to just a small area or just a small group of people. So when Jacob's family and all his sons and their family opened up their cupboards, they weren't finding food or choices for that matter to eat. And just in case you think only your parents raise their voices or get stern with you, not a chance. Here's Jacob giving his grown sons a talking to by saying, why are you standing around looking at each other? Go and get us some food. Because otherwise, we're gonna die. Well, this was a serious situation. They really are about to starve. 
I want to show you this map so that you get an idea of where Joseph was at in Egypt and where his family was back in the land of Canaan. Joseph and Pharaoh are living in the area of the red square on the left side of the map. And Jacob, Joseph's dad, and all his brothers and their families are living in the area of the purple square on the right side of the screen. They aren't exactly next door neighbors, but it's a distance that wasn't impossible to get to even back then. It's about a 200 mile journey, which today most people would drive in about three hours time. Back then in Joseph's time, it was about 10 days worth of travel going by animal instead of Chevy or Toyota. So the brothers all set out to make their way from the land of Canaan to Egypt 200 miles away. Do you remember how many brothers there were? Think back. If you said 12, you're right. Jacob had 12 sons. Joseph isn't there. So that means there are still 11 living with their father along with their wives and kids. What I want you to remember is that how many years have actually passed. It's been 20 years since his jealous brothers threw him in a pit. Here's the thing. Not all 11 brothers make the trip. In fact, only 10 of them are sent to go and bring back grain to feed to their families. That's because Jacob has not forgotten his beloved son, Joseph, that was born from his favorite wife, Rachel. So which brother is left behind in Canaan with dad? It's the other son born from Rachel, Benjamin. Once again, we see Jacob showing his favoritism towards Rachel and her children. So when the 10 brothers arrive in Egypt, they're brought before Joseph because he's the man who would sell all the grain to the people and they bow down to him. Does that sound familiar? Joe recognizes his brothers even though they don't recognize him. Well, why don't they? Well, he's probably changed enough in the last 20 years and doesn't look like the young 17-year-old baby brother that they put in the pit. And besides, why would they ever think that their brother that they sold as a slave would now be in a position of power? It's really a pretty impossible thing to have had happened, except they hadn't factored in God and all the ways that he takes all the pieces of our lives and brings them together to do things that we can't imagine. And I'm also guessing that Joseph is dressed like an Egyptian, which might make it hard for them to recognize him. When Joseph sees them, he questions, where are you from? And why are you here? Then he even goes so far as to call them spies that have come to check out the land. And Joseph sees them bowing down to him and he remembers his dream as a 17-year-old boy where his brother's grain had bowed down to his grain. Does that all start to sound familiar? Are you seeing how Joe's dreams are coming true? The brothers try to convince Joseph by saying, we aren't spies, we're the sons of one man. We just need food. Oh, and our youngest brother, he's back at home with our father and one of them is no more. No more? Really? Seems like they leave out the part of the truth where they don't actually say, oh yeah, and we sold a brother to some merchants. Joseph, even though he knows they aren't spies, tells them this starting in verse 14 of chapter 32. As I said, you are spies. This is how I will test your story. I swear by the life of Pharaoh that you will never leave Egypt unless your youngest brother comes here. One of you must go and get your brother. I'll keep the rest of you here in prison. Then we'll find out whether or not your story is true. By the life of Pharaoh, if it turns out that you don't have a younger brother, then I'll know you are spies. So Joseph puts them in prison for three days. And on the third day, Joseph says to them, I am a God-fearing man. If you do as I say, you will live. 
If you really are honest men, choose one of your brothers to remain in prison. The rest of you may go home with grain for your starving families, but you must bring back your youngest brother back to me. This will prove that you are telling the truth and you will not die. To this, they agreed. Well, all the brothers started talking amongst themselves, having no idea that Joseph actually understands what they're saying. Joseph had been speaking to them through an interpreter, pretending he didn't understand their Hebrew language. Remember, that was the language he had originally learned. So they started saying how they are being punished for what they had done to their brother, the very one that ends up standing in front of them. And the oldest brother who had wanted to save him, Reuben, tells them, see what's happening? I told you not to sell him. His blood is on our hands and we're getting what we have coming to us. Joseph at this time, he, he actually turns away because he sees that his brothers, his family are sad and hurting and realizing what they did was wrong. And he started to cry himself. Joseph doesn't wait for them to actually decide who's going to stay behind. He takes the brother named Simeon and has him tied up right before their eyes. He then commands the men working for him to fill up their sacks with grain and the things that they need to travel back to their homes. And then secretly, Joseph has the money that they had brought and given to pay for their grain put back into the sacks and right on top of the grain. Huh? Why is he doing that? Well, why doesn't he just keep the money? Mm. It's more puzzle pieces to this great story. I really like the book of Genesis. The story of mankind just has a very exciting beginning, don't you think? I just, oh, I get so excited. Okay, back to our story. So when the brothers stopped later that night and they stop for the night and they go to get some of the grain out of their sacks to give to their donkeys and they see the money and they're all saying, oh no, why is this money here? What is God doing to us? Well, I would say teaching them a lesson, but the brothers get home and they themselves tell the whole story to their dad, Jacob including the part about having to leave Simeon behind and needing to take Benjamin back to this really important man in Egypt that they don't actually know is their brother. And what do you think old dad says? Sure, no way. He says, are you kidding me? Joseph is gone, now Simeon is gone. You really think I'm gonna let you take my Benjamin too? The oldest brother, Reuben, tries to convince old dad, but he's not having it. You see, he sees Benjamin as his only tie left to his beloved Rachel, and he refuses to be without him. Well, let's look at a few things. First, we are seeing that Joseph's dream that he had 20 years earlier has come true. I've been saying it over and over again, waiting is hard. Not knowing when God is going to answer a prayer is hard, but we sometimes don't get right, or what we sometimes forget to remember is that God is bringing all of these pieces together. Unlike us, he's patient. Are you patient? I'm trying to be better now that I'm older, and I don't get it right all the time, and I certainly didn't get it right when I was younger like you. But I will say this, the sooner in your life that you can learn to trust God for the way he is working things out, the less time you will spend getting upset and well, honestly, giving yourself a tummy ache. And second, while it could seem as though Joseph is teaching his brothers a lesson with this whole putting the money back in their sacks, what we're actually witnessing is what Joseph has learned that God has used the brother's mistake. Joseph was showing them grace, which is giving someone something they don't deserve or haven't earned, showing kindness. He was providing for his family out of the abundance that he had. He could have kept the brothers in jail and not release them to go back home and take revenge and hold on to ugly feelings in his heart and mind. 
I'd like to encourage you to talk with the adults in your life about taking revenge and being resentful, which is just a big word for holding on to those mean feelings we have towards others. Because if the adults have been joining us in church for the last few months, they've learned a lot about this very thing from our series called Rotten. And you can have some great conversations with those adults. Showing someone grace isn't always easy. It's easier to just stay mad and angry, but in the end, it actually hurts our hearts more than the person that we're mad at. Joseph waited a long time to see God answer prayers, but we can see that he trusted God and was acting in a godly way by showing his brothers grace. Next time, we're going to see if they come back for Simeon and bring Benjamin along. I pray you can spend time this next week learning to show grace to those around you. And until then, stay well and be kind.